Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2, second channel video. Today, we're gonna take a look at this PC. Yes, another episode of PC Archaeology, and I know I've done quite a number of these lately, so I'm gonna breeze through a lot of the standard stuff that this machine has, because how interesting is it to look at yet another regular old XT? First, a little background. Justin, who's a patron, dropped off the IBM 5170, and I'm sure you've seen those videos on the main channel. He also dropped off three of these XTs, and I've already done two videos on taking those apart and taking a look at the inside. This was the third and final one, and there's not a whole lot to say about this one. It's actually an IBM 5160, so it's an IBM PC XT here. It's missing the top cover, just like the other two XTs, and the parts inside are, you know, pretty run of the mill. We'll take a quick look at those. But there's one thing in particular that is interesting about this machine. You notice here it's got the original IBM five and a quarter inch disk drive. This will be double sided. It does have a hard drive here, which you can just see the top of right here. It's a Seagate, I think, ST225, so 20 megabyte hard drive. And it has a tape drive. So it's got a little bit going on here, but nothing exceptional. It's not like it wasn't normal to have these types of accessories in your XT. Most people had at least a hard drive and the floppy drive. But what this machine has on the back, which is so very strange, is this thing. When I saw this, I was like, what the heck is going on? So what this is, and let me see if I can get this off. Here it is. It's the MicroPack 1 from Everex Systems. And you'll see here, it has an IEC connector, and this is, see there's a regular IBM 5160 back here. This clips onto the case with these two little hooks here, and then if you align it just correctly, it pushes in to the IEC power output that's on the back of all of these machines that started with the 5150. Normally you plugged your monitor into that connector, and when you turned on the chunky power switch, it would send power to your monitor. I think the IBM 5151, which is the monochrome screen that IBM released with the 5150, it didn't even have a power switch. So you had to plug it in to the pass-through to allow you to have that monitor turn off and on with a computer. What this thing does is by clipping on the back and connecting to that pass-through, allows this to be powered up when the computer's turned on, and it still has the pass-through there it is, the pass-through connector is there. And you can see that this is like some type of auxiliary power supply. And then look at this cable. The cable comes out of the power supply, it goes through this, I guess some type of a locking connector, which probably unscrews, there it is. It's like a four pin DIN or something like that. And then it gives this. Now there's a rubber seal on here and that would imply that this probably should have been installed in some type of a, a round hole on the back of the computer case, and then you would just plug this in and screw it in. But someone, instead of that, has taken this little cover off, which, if I recall, this cover is for accessing the battery on the IBM 5162. I'm not totally sure, but let's take this off and look at what's underneath. But they basically just took this cover off, ran the connector through it, and then jammed the wires on and put this cover back on. Maybe when I take this off, we're gonna see like a DB25 type uh, hole in the back of the case that allow you to screw in like an extra port. I can't remember. No, it's just rectangular. And yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know what IBM's original intention for this was on the XT, but at least on the 5162, which was a 286 in this exact chassis, you put the alkaline battery through there. It was like in a kind of a little holder, I think. I've never had one of those machines myself, but I seem to recall that was the case. Now this connector doesn't really fit through here, but maybe what's on the other end of this wire does. As far as this XT goes, it's in pretty dirty shape. I don't know, I wouldn't say I call it rough shape. It was found in the same situation as the other two XTs and the 5170. It was in a, a hoarder house that was being cleaned out. I think Justin said all these machines were up in the attic, meaning they were exposed to a lot of hot and cold weather for who knows how many years. And obviously without a cover, dirt and everything else would go inside of this machine and potentially moisture and whatnot. The 5160 here is very unmolested, at least from the IBM standpoint. It's a 64 to 256K system board, 
which is interesting to me because the 5150 ended up being released in its lifetime with the same capacity as that. And the real only difference between the end 5150s and then these 5160s was the number of slots because the original 5150 I think only had five slots and this one has eight. And there's also only a keyboard port on the 5160, the XT. It does not have the cassette port, which was next to the keyboard port on the 5150. Let's just take a quick look at all these cards that are installed in this machine. First one here is obviously some type of monochrome or CGA and printer card. It's one of the later clone cards, so nothing particularly interesting there. These were super common and run of the mill. Next card is some kind of multi IO card. Ooh, and it's got a battery on here. It's a RAM expansion, has a serial port, parallel port and a game port, and obviously a real time clock. And at the minimum, a card like this is necessary to bring this system from 256K up to 512 or 640K. Also pretty amazing is a Varda battery that's very minimally leaked onto the card. That's amazing, to be honest. These cards are quite useful because if you have a 5150 especially, you absolutely need a card like this because the early 5150s have a maximum of 64K on the motherboard. And actually, the 5150 that I have is one of those early 16K to 64K motherboards. So it's literally 64K PC is all you can do on that machine without expansion. Next up, we have hard drive controller card of some kind. The EEPROM has an Everex sticker. It does have a Western Digital chipset, but Everex is the same brand that is on this here. This says Everex as well. Next up, we have something with a 50 pin ribbon cable, it looks like. This is probably, oh, it's an Everex systems card as well. This is clearly going to that tape drive. It's heading out under the hard drive. Pop this connector off here. You'd almost think that maybe this was a SCSI card or something like that, but I'm pretty sure it is not. There is not nearly enough ICs on here for SCSI. So I'm thinking more like an 8-bit IDE bus kind of thing, like it mostly just transfers the bus. These are PAL chips here though, so there is some custom logic on here. This would have a lot more TTL logic on it if it weren't for these four PAL chips. Part number EV811REV-B. And the last card, this appears to be probably an IBM asynchronous card. Oh, I don't know if it's IBM or not, but it does say async card there. Serial card. Has a number printed right here, 150-1485XM. And that's actually it for this thing. Um, this is the floppy cable here. So the floppy controller was pillaged out of this thing at some point. Not much to mention for this motherboard though, the corrosion from the Varda battery did not get anywhere near this motherboard, so it is in perfect shape, which is pretty sweet. So this is the cable that comes from that rear power supply, and look at that, there's a standard connector there, and the other one is definitely going to that tape drive. Now I'm really feeling that this was probably designed for the original IBM 5150, and not for this machine. The reason why I say that is because the power supply in the XT was beefed up over the one that was in the 5150. IBM never intended the 5150 to ever have a hard drive in it. It was just a single or a dual floppy drive machine. I think any accessories like hard drives might be connected externally in a chassis that had its own power supply. So solutions like this were probably created to allow you to run an internal hard drive on the 5150 without risking overloading your power supply. Now the reality is I think it's probably fine to run a 5150 with a hard drive inside. In fact, the 5150 that I have now, I bought from an old gentleman here in Portland who owned it since it was new. And that machine had the original IBM power supply in it and it had a Seagate hard drive in it. In fact, I think it had two uh, half height floppy drives as well. And it, it totally worked fine. But probably if you wanted to stay within spec, you needed a solution like this. It could also well be that this tape drive that they added in here actually draws quite a bit of current, so much so that this stock power supply just couldn't handle it. I'm gonna do a jump cut to a fully disassembled IBM 5160. The parts inside this machine are all pretty run of the mill. This is the tape drive here and it was stacked underneath the hard drive or yeah, under the hard drive 
I did have this piece of cardboard sitting there to try to prevent some short circuits because the main circuit board for this is relatively close to the top there. So the hard drive would have been potentially shorting to that. Probably would have been okay though. But there's the front and that is the tape mechanism. So the tape goes in sideways and has two spindles that probably come up. They look a little bit like the ones on a regular audio tape. And then you can see the head there. It looks like it's a, at least a two track head. And uh, yeah, I don't really know what mechanism this is. The tape drive itself, there's the model number. It's a TIAC MT-2ST-20D-10-U. There it is. And on the bottom here, good amount of components, has two motors here. So it's a direct drive setup for those two wheels. Uh, take it, this is a little motor here as well. Kind of different mechanisms here. I guess the loading and the unloading. 50 pin edge connector which is very similar to SASE, not SCSI, but SASE. I don't know what it stands for actually. <laughs> SCSI, SCSI, Small Computer System Interface. SASE is like small appliance system interface. I don't really know. But anyways, it has a connector just like that <laughs> on SASE drives. Not much else to report on this TIAC tape drive. Floppy drive is the standard Tandon one that IBM OEM for their machine. So this is a double-sided unit. They were using these Tandon drives uh, since the original 5150. And the belt is kind of stuck on the wheel. In fact, this is not one of the fabric belts. This one is just like a rubber one. Um, that bearing is not great, but not, not terrible. The motor seems okay. Let's open it. Yeah, that's probably fine. A lot of these drives have a fabric reinforced belt. Those I find to be extremely reliable and durable and they don't really break. They don't get sticky or anything like that. This one's not sticky, but it does not seem like the fabric type. Let me just see if it's stretchy. No, it's not really stretchy. So maybe this is fabric as well. I don't know. It does seem to turn pretty well. So maybe just a little bit of a wash on this belt will make this drive work properly. These drives are extremely robust and reliable. What can break though, is there's like a little plastic thing here that holds the lever thing together. I don't know if it's the tandem drives that breaks. There are certain types of full height, full height drives like this where that snaps, but there are STL files for those so you can try to print new parts that go in here. Motherboard's pretty standard affair. Date codes on the chips show the later part of 1984. So I don't remember the exact year that the 5160 came out, maybe 1983. So this machine was a couple years old by the time it came out. Good old Seagate ST225. These are generally pretty reliable. We'll see if we can read the data off of that. Power supply is an Aztec branded unit. It is the original IBM part though. It does have a date code right there, 42nd week of 1984. So that jives with the motherboard. And the rest of the stuff we looked at and yeah, there's just this extra power supply by Everex, which we will need to see if it works. But I took the cable off here and it's exactly what I thought it was. It was just two of the standard Molex connectors and this round connector. Now, incidentally, I just took a look at the back of my IBM 5150 and that case has a round hole with a little cover over it. That really reinforces exactly what I said, that this connector was designed to accommodate that exact hole on the 5150. So I do find it kind of unusual that they actually use this on the 5160 because I bet this power supply probably could power all this stuff up without the need of this. Okay, over to the bench. Let's see if any of this stuff still works. First, let's see if this Everex power supply thing works. So I have it connected to this old hard drive. This hard drive, unfortunately, it spins up, but it doesn't work properly. So it's gonna give a little bit of a nice load for the power supply. I have the multimeter connected to the five volt rail. And what you have to do, if you wanna connect something to this, all I need to do is use a regular IEC power cord and just plug this in. Now, I'll keep my hands away from it because it's obviously could blow up or something like that. But let's plug it in, see what happens. Oh, and it made a very unhappy noise there. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> I don't know if that's coming from the hard drive or what. Let's unplug it and see what happens with no load. Well, with no load, we're actually getting 5.15 volts. Let's check the other rail. 
bit high at 13 volts, but considering it's got no load on it, that is understandable. Does this say anything about how much it can power? What can it give out? 110 volts, dangerous voltages inside the micro pack one. And no, it doesn't really say anything about how much current it can give out. Now this hard drive, which is a Z-Back model 4020, maybe this thing draws too much current. So let me just grab a different one. Here's a random IDE hard drive, some kind of a Connor CP361G. Now this is gonna be a lot less current than something like one of those five and a quarter inch full height drives or half height drives that would have been used at the time of this power supply. So if it spins this up, then great, let's see. Whoa, 15 volts. <laughs> well, it didn't kill the hard drive, um, but it was giving 15 volts on the 12 volt rail. So I'd say that there's probably something faulty about this power supply. Like its regulation is just not very good and is certainly not very trustworthy. <laughs> you don't wanna give 15 volts to your components. Let me just pop the cover off this thing so we can take a look at the inside. Obviously, speaking of the cover, it is a little bit bashed. It got squished right here and bent at some point. I'm sure that has no uh, effect on the internals. There it is. Regulated supply. Power comes in here. There's a fuse and an inline fuse holder. We have a four discrete diode bridge rectifier there. Down here, we have the main switching transistor. There's probably either on the back side of this board, which let me just pop it out of here. Hopefully there's a little controller or something for the switch mode, or it could be using discrete transistors as well. The very oops, simple feedback circuit. There are the internals. It says APT incorporated model number SPS40A SKP394V-0 made in Japan. And it is definitely a single-sided PCB. Oh, there's the backside. Luckily, none of the caps have corroded. It does have a kind of a conformal coating on there. See the glossiness on this section here? This is the high voltage section. As far as isolation, it's actually decent. It has a decent isolation distance between the low voltage side here and the high voltage side. On the low voltage side, which connects to the output here, probably runs at 12 volts, this entire power supply. And then this heat sink is attached to a linear voltage regulator, which probably goes from 12 to five. And I see there's a diode here for the output. It has a little heat sink on it. It's very small output capacitance. There's just not a whole lot going on here. And the funny thing is I still am not immediately seeing where the switching transistor is out. Oh, there it is, it's right down there. So it does just use a regular transistor for switching. So very simplistic design for this uh, particular power supply. Oh, here's some more markings here. So we have three amps at five volts and we have two amps at 12 volts. And we do have minus 12 volts DC at um, half an amp. Do I even see, I don't even see, oh, yep, there's a little tiny voltage regulator down there. It's probably for the minus 12, which is not even connected actually, right? Because this thing here is missing a pin because it only is going to 12 and five. I'm guessing that this was probably designed to work only with that tape drive. That's what I'm thinking. I don't think this is for hard drives. If anyone is familiar like with what this was originally designed to be used for, uh, let me know. But yeah, when it's only giving um, 12 volts at two amps, that is not really enough. What's overall kind of odd to me about this thing is why did this exist when the power supply in the 5150 and 5160 was a standard form factor? If you needed more current in your machine to, to run hard drives and things, wouldn't you just replace the entire power supply with a more powerful unit? Maybe they were really expensive back then and something like this was cheaper, but it just seems a bit odd to have this hodgepodge sort of stick on adapter when you could just swap out the power supply. Okay, everything is assembled, but I'm using my known good power supply. I'm not gonna try the IBM one quite yet. I have everything in this machine except for the tape controller card and this like, monochrome card most likely. I'll test this in a second, but this pretty much is gonna work. I have no doubts that it works fine. And this card and the tape drive, I have no real way to test it because I don't have any tapes. So not that I would ever use this again anyways. 
So I'm just gonna leave this out. But the floppy drive is connected. I don't have a floppy controller in here yet. Hard drive is connected to the original controller. And because I don't have the video card in here, I have a VGA card, 8-bit VGA card connected, just in case this thing does work. Now, shorted tantalums. I mean, we got these boys right here on the board and they're on the drive here and on some of these cards. They could well be a problem. Now, when I hit the power switch, there could be some fireworks because we have these good old tantalums here and on the drive and on some of these cards here that could be shorted like that is normal, but I'm just gonna go for broke and give this a try. The power supply did go into protection mode. So now it's a matter of unplugging things until I figure out what is shorted. So let's take this floppy drive off. Whoa, I heard a pop. Something smokes, we've got the aroma of uh, burning tantalums. <laughs> let's pop this one out. Ooh, smelly. Still shorted. Let's see, we'll take the hard drive off and it's controller. I don't think it's gonna be these. Still shorted. Take off this uh, expansion card, which I did take the battery off by the way, and there was a little bit of corrosion, just a tiny bit right under there. Okay, let's see, does that make a difference? Oh, nope, and we have some fireworks from right there on the motherboard. Oh boy. So the fireworks were coming from this capacitor right here, and you see that little black pinhole on it? That is where those sparks came out of. That's the cap. <laughs> That's causing the problem. So of course, if you weren't as reckless as me, you would take your multimeter and you would test uh, between the black wires on here, except on the connector, and these various color wires. So we have red as five volts. I think the yellow is 12, and the, uh, I don't know, orange is probably a negative, and then, um, what is the blue power good signal? Something like that. Maybe the white is, I don't know. Anyways, you would just check to make sure that those aren't bad and we would have had a shorted cap right here. So I'm just gonna take this off the board. Come on. So I took my snips and I kind of destroyed this capacitor. I did that because I wanted to have those legs there so I could more easily pull that thing off the board I remember I've done some videos recently where I've had to change out these, these tantalum caps. And on boards like this, IBM made them really, really with a lot of thick copper layers to them. So there's a ground plane on here and it makes desoldering very difficult unless you have a proper desoldering iron. So my advice is if you don't have the right equipment to just try to break the cap up in a way that leaves the legs exposed and you can just solder the new capacitor right onto those existing legs if you so desire. Now I'm just noticing that there's actually no markings on this for plus and negative. How freaking rude IBM. It's not the end of the world. You can easily figure that out using your multimeter, but it'd be nice if they just had some markings on there with the multimeter on continuity. I'm sure I can figure this out. So the center leg is not the ground. It is the outside two legs that are the ground pins. And as is typical with the ones that seem to blow, it's probably the 12 volt wire, which is this uh, yellow one here. So that's the third one closest to me here. And exactly, that's what it is. It always seems like it's the 12 volt ones that pop, that go bad and short first. I don't know what's up with that, but that just seems to always be the case. Either way, I'm gonna check to see if any others are shorted. So that's five volts and that is not shorted. And we have a negative something or other, that's fine. The orange wire, I don't know what that one is, that's fine. And we have the blue wire. Yeah, so we don't have any other shorts on here. It was just <laughs> the 12 volt one. So I haven't replaced that cap yet. You could definitely run this board without that. Mainly that is for the ISA slots because sometimes cards use the 12 volt rail, but not always. And I don't think any of these cards actually even use it. So it doesn't really matter. So I'm just gonna try turning this on with nothing connected. And there we go, the power supply. Um, is running, so there's no issues there. So I'm just gonna reinstall all the cards. All right, here we are, ready for try number two. Here we go. Power supply spinning up. We, uh, oh, I don't have the video cable connected. Let's quickly get that on here. Now I think I need to change the jumpers or the switches on this so it properly 
initializes the video card. I have to do a quick, quick Google search here. Oh no, it's coming up anyways. It's gonna say something about CRT error or something around those uh, that because I think if you have it set for monochrome or CGA, it tries to initialize the BIOS on the motherboard and the VGA card has its own BIOS. So we got a 301 and a 601. 301 is because there's no keyboard. 601, of course, is because there is no floppy controller connected. But this thing did turn on, look at that. It's a survivor, my favorite thing to say. I have a keyboard connected and I put a floppy controller in here, uh, not using the original cable because I need to have a, what is it, like a 34 pin connector here as opposed to an edge connector. But it is connected to the original drive here. So let's turn this on again. I'm just gonna stick this cable under the hard drive, take the stress off here. There we go, everything is powering up. I didn't even notice how much RAM this thing had on the last power cycle. Let's take a closer look. Well, 128K is what it stopped at, and that is definitely not the correct amount of memory. I think what's going on, it's actually trying to boot. Wait, it's actually booting the hard drive. This hard drive works? What? What? Now I tried to run some programming that says insufficient memory, but it stopped counting at 256K, even though clearly there's RAM on this card here. I think what's happened is that some of this memory on the main board is bad and it's not even recognizing that it's installed. So this is 64K, 128, you know, when you add these two together and then another 256. So there's probably a problem in bank three. So it counts the first 128 and then it just stops at the third bank and it just thinks there's no more RAM. This memory here doesn't work anymore because this would pick up after the 256K to add up to whatever, another 256K or, or uh, probably up to um, 640K, but it has to be continuous. If there's a hole in the memory, that right away is gonna cause us just to stop counting like that. Now, one thing though, I need to check that these switch settings are correct. They could have been jostled because this computer was thrown you know, around in a pile and there was, I think there was loose parts in it when I found it originally. So some of those could have been switched. So I need to look those up and see if it's indeed set for 256K on the motherboard first. Good old minus zero degrees dot net has the switch settings. So we need enable banks zero, one, two, and three. So that switches three and four need to be off. And I can confirm that three and four are set to off. I'm just gonna swap them to on and then back to off again, in case the connections are dirty inside these switches. It switches five and six. They need to be on and on if we're gonna have a card that has its own BIOS. So I'll switch those to on and on. And then seven, eight should be on and on if we have just one floppy drive, which we do. Switch two should be uh, on because there's no math coprocessor and that is on. And switch one should be off for normal setting and it is off. Okay, let me just power cycle this thing again. Pretty sure the problem is again, RAM problem on the, on the main board here with this third bank. Okay, same thing, it just showed 128K. So I'm gonna quickly swap out the main board memory here in bank three, try to get this thing working. And there we go, 256K is working on the main board here. The bad chip ended up being this one right here. Took the chip out, I have an X drawn on it. The way I figured that out is I found uh, nine new working chips and I replaced four at a time. I mean, I could have replaced five at a time or one at a time or whatever, but I, would, I put these first four in, I swapped them out with the known good chips still stopped at 128K. I did the next four chips and then it counted up to 256K. And then I think I replaced these two back with the original. It still was counting to 256K. I replaced these two back with the original and then it went down to 128K again. And then it was just a matter of figuring out which of these two chips it was. And it was this chip that was bad. Now, if you don't have extra chips, you still could have done this with these chips. So you could have taken these and moved them into this bank, like swap these two around and basically it would have then stopped counting at 64K because this bank would have counted up and then it would have stopped at this one. And the reason why that was happening is probably because this chip that I took out, not this one, but the, the bad one was totally dead. And what happens on the PC is it looks to see how much memory you have when you first boot it up. And if one of the data bits is completely dead, that can trick the computer into just to thinking that memory doesn't exist at all. 
I think as part of the detection routine, it tries to store a little bit of information in each bank of RAM, and then it reads it back. And if it doesn't get back what it expects, then it thinks that RAM is not there. Well, one dead chip, or if you take one chip out, it's just not gonna see that bank at all. So that chip was essentially completely dead. If it had had a bit error, so it was generally working, but say certain bits within this chip were bad, then it probably would have counted the memory, but then reported a memory error and told us which bit was bad because each of these chips represents one bit. Now, remember, it's a 16-bit processor, but it has an 8-bit data bus. So you have eight of these chips plus one for parity, and that means that you know each one of these is a, you know bit zero, one, two, three, all the way through seven. So in this case, I guess it was, what is this, uh, zero, one, two, three, four. Bit four was just missing entirely because this chip is just dead. And I would have been able to find that by uh, swapping these chips around. And then you just have to buy one replacement chip. But the 64K memory is the same type that's used on like a Commodore 64. And it's so common and easy to get these days that, you know, if you have a PC like this and it has a RAM error like this, just buy four or just buy nine chips at a time. And then you can do this. So I'm going to reinstall all these cards again and restore this thing back. And we should hopefully be counting to 640K. That is if the memory on that RAM card is all in good shape. Nine of these chips here makes 64 kilobytes of RAM. So we have 64, 128, 256, and 384 of memory on this card. And 384 plus 256, of course, adds up to 640K, which is what I expect to see when I power this on. So everything's reconnected. Here we go. There we go. We crossed over the 128 barrier. We're approaching 256K. 256K. Here we go. Keep on counting. Let's get to that magic 640K. Yeah, it's still going. So the bad chip, by the way, was a MOSTEC chip. So generally these are pretty reliable. It wasn't one of the MT memory chips, which are so famous for being super flaky. These ones here look to be Toshiba chips. And look at that, 640K, RAM check passed. Floppy drive just seeked, and we should see the hard drive booting. Here we go, it's booting. Look at that. It's running something called QA, Q&A. What exactly is Q&A? Q&A version 2.0 from Semantic Corporation, copyright 1986. File, report, write, utilities, intelligent assistant. Is this like uh, some type of uh, smart assistant like we have today? Let's give that a try. This is a database software, I guess. Let's get acquainted. Hi, I'm your new personal database assistant. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little ASCII art little man there. I'm a special kind of assistant, you're a software assistant. What makes me special is I understand many English requests. Just tell me in English what you want to know or do and I'll do it. For example, maybe you have a database of employees. You ask, show me the address of the sales employees sorted by region and show their spouses too. And that gives you the answer here, Eastern. You have two names here, their address and their spouse. <laughs> There's a little ASCII art guy holding up like a Olympic torch, Woohoo! The assistant can create reports, get stacks of forms, perform calculations. Oh, how funny. Okay, so I'm gonna ask it to do something. Oh, okay, we have contacts, employees, property, and zip. These have dates of 1995 on them. Let's open the employee one. Enter your English request. Show me a list of all employees. Oh, it's understanding my English. <laughs> ah, what should I do? Create a report, show the full name and department for all forms. Okay, yeah, sure. Do whatever you think is best. All right, and there's a list of employees and I, I think this is fake data because one of them is called Scrimble... <laughs> one of them is called Scribblemonger Throckmorton and the R&D department. Scribblemonger. <laughs> Let's just poke around this hard drive a little more and see what else we can find on here. 
We have Lotus, one, two, three, most likely, WordPerfect 5.1, something called Pub, something called CC Plus, New PS, QA, which we already looked at, CC4, Quicken 3, and Fastback. Fastback being backup software, obviously. I'm looking in the Pub folder here. Uh, what is this stuff here? Let's look at the EXE specifically. FP. I assume this is some kind of like desktop publishing program, maybe something like that. Ooh, first publisher and it's has a GUI to it. Now that's super fancy. This is a WYSI wig word processor or text processor. This isn't too bad considering this thing is running at 4.77 megahertz. Let's see if we hit F1 for file. Okay. Oh, it looks like it has mouse support. F2, F3. We have different fonts available to us. Monaco. Oh, this is the Monaco font. Let's see if we can load something off of here. Maybe there's like a demo or something. Uh, save file name. I don't really want to save, so I'm going to hit no. Okay. Hey, this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively impressed by this. Pushing up and down seems to move the mouse pointer. But I can't quite figure out how to select something, so I'm just going to type it out. Example.pub. I have to wonder if the original card that was in here was a monochrome Hercules type card and that this supported Hercules graphics, which is probably the case. It's most likely why they replaced the IBM card with that, because they wanted to have this graphics capability. Um, this is it. I thought I would see something a little bit more graphical than this. Okay, I'm loading something called Menu, and that seems to have some actual graphics here. First food group, dish description, fourth food group, and they have various things here. Hey, you know, this works. Considering how old this computer is, this is actually working. Pretty neat. We have new PS. I think this might be Print Shop. Let's take a look. Oh, yep, Broaderbound Software. Broaderbound Software presents the new Print Shop. And again, this seems to be running in sort of like a Hercules mode. It's not using the VGA itself, but this is the more fancy version of Print Shop. Uh, select printer, test printer. Let's create a new sign or poster. I'm gonna design my own. Let's make it wide. I'd like to have a gra uh, I'd like to have a border. Let's make it a wide border. Oh, this is sort of fancy. Let's use columns. Why don't we add a graphic here? We'll just load it right in the center. High res graphics. A lot of these are very similar to the graphics that were in the original version of Print Shop. I used a print that Print Shop a ton on my Apple II back in the day. But I'm gonna say, I'm gonna put a file cabinet one here. Okay, and we're gonna put a message in here. And I'm gonna use this font here. And I'm gonna say, oh, you can do different 3D modes. Let's do solid. I'm just gonna say, please, Put your files away. No. Okay, how do we do preview? F10, preview. Please put your files away. <laughs> oh, print shop. So good, so good. There is a copy of basic in the root directory and I just ran this color bar program here using basic A, I think this just prints colors, using the CGA palette. Yep, there it is. Not much to look at there. I don't know why it's like off to the side for some reason. That's the monitor not adjusted correctly. I typed system to get back to DOS. Yeah, there's just not a whole lot on here. Anything else that's, these are just all the basic IBM stuff like the demos and whatever that comes with basic. Unfortunately, there just aren't any interesting demos or games or anything like that on here. 
I loaded up the backup software utility, Fastback Plus. So this is uh, what they were using to do that. If I go to restore source, it's showing the floppy drive as a source. I assume it would show the tape drive here if that were actually inserted into this computer, but it's not. So really nothing to look at there. Oh, and in case anyone is wondering, this is IBM PC DOS version 3.2. That's what's installed on here. Let's see if this floppy drive is actually working. First, I'm gonna give it a quick blow of air. Then I'm gonna use this floppy cleaning disc here to give this thing a little clean on the inside. Disc error, I wonder why. <laughs> Retry. Here's a copy of DOS 3.3. Stick this in here. See if this thing can actually read it. That's odd. It says internal stack failure, system halted. Uh, hmm. That could have been something after running these programs. Let's power cycle this. This is actually a bootable floppy, so it should try to boot off of it. I'm gonna pop out this uh, hard drive controller and unplug the hard drive. We know it works. <laughs> And it's rather noisy, so we're just gonna leave that off. Hmm. Uh, this is weird. The system does not appear to be posting anymore. Let's just make sure all these cards are seated in here correctly. Well, I have to say, this is kind of weird. I don't quite get what's happening. Let me just pop these cards out here. See if something died. Maybe some of this RAM died on the RAM card here. Yeah, and just like that, this motherboard appears to be dead. It has gone from working to death. That's kind of unusual. And it all happened when I tried to read the disk. I'm wondering if maybe this thing has a problem on it, like a fault and it sent 12 volts into the motherboard or something and killed it. That would suck, but I, I can't imagine that was the case. But anything is possible, I suppose. And unfortunately, there is no way to use a postcard on these original XTs. They don't support postcodes. So I can't use the postcard to see, perhaps it's starting to boot. Maybe it's failing because there's a RAM problem. It could be that this first bank of RAM died or a, a, one of the chips went bad, and that is what killed it. I don't know, but uh, I think that's beyond the scope of this video. I'm just gonna bust out a different motherboard that does work and just quickly test out this disk drive. Okay, 386SX motherboard here. I have the XT IDE connected, so it's gonna boot off of that. I have this floppy drive connected again, and I put the original serial card in there. So let's just see now if this reads the disk. It does read the disk, so... Uh, there definitely was not a problem there. In fact, uh, let's reboot the computer and I should be able to boot off this disk drive here. Let's just give that a try. I just need to set this to boot off A. I'm gonna also change it to seek and let's see what happens. Good old reliable tandem uh, mechanisms here. Thing left for dead. Oh, uh, oh, you know what? Of course, it's not booting off the A drive because the XT IDE will override whatever set in the BIOS. You have to push the A key when the XT IDE BIOS comes up, which is now. There it is, booting off A. And there we are. DOS 3.3 booted off this old floppy drive. It works. So there we have it, another Left 4 Dead XT machine, and it totally worked. Well, it worked up until the motherboard stopped working. My hunch is that the RAM on bank zero has gone bad because it talked about the stack problem. Well, the stack of course is stored at the bottom of memory and therefore I have a feeling that something in this bank has gone wrong. So I'll do a little follow-up video at some point where I troubleshoot the, this motherboard to see if I can get this working again. But otherwise this thing works. Another working ST225. These drives are beasts. I've definitely had some of these that are bad, but more often than not, they work. And really you're supposed to park the heads on this when you're done using it, which I didn't do on this. But what I like to do is now that this is working, I'm gonna put this on this 3D6 on my other workbench 
and I'm gonna run spin right on this overnight with a thorough analysis of the, the disk surface so it can find and map all the bad sectors and then I can uh, mark this drive as fully, fully functional after it's gone through the spin right analysis. This disk drive needs a good cleanup disassembly, just clean out the dirt and uh, lubricate the tracks and stuff like that. I will try to clean up the tiny bit of corrosion that's on this RAM expansion board. These are useful for XT machines. And I think everything else in this computer, oh, there's the power supply, I didn't even test that. It most certainly will work. Uh, it probably needs a really good clean on the inside and potentially maybe it has a leaky cap, but I doubt it. IBM had Aztec make a lot of their power supplies. They are dead, dead reliable. Much better than power supplies made in the 90s, which were flaky and leaky and junky compared to that early stuff. So that is it. Another IBM 60 full of useful parts, left for dead, almost thrown away and saved. So thanks very much, Justin, for bringing that machine to me. Thanks to my patrons to, for supporting the channel. If you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. And of course, it's a second channel, so a sub would be very helpful, even if you're subbed to my main channel. I'd like to keep growing this channel. And I guess that's gonna be it. So thank you very much. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.